Hello and welcome to 7 Days of Science. In the headlines this week, paleontologists have revealed a new contender for the largest dinosaur that ever lived, a genetic study has shown how Neanderthals helped modern Europeans to wake up earlier, a megalodon tooth has been recovered from the bottom of the Pacific Ocean, and much more. Starting off the news this week, a satellite built in the UK and funded in collaboration with ESA has unfortunately suffered a major failure in orbit and is unlikely to be restored to full working capacity. The HotSat-1 satellite was launched back in June this year on a Falcon 9 rocket in the USA, and its mission was to detect and map the heat loss from buildings to help us better understand how structures waste energy, which in turn can help us better understand how to act more efficiently. There had already been a lot of interest from organisations back on the planet that wanted to use this data to help better manage their heating, and to help work out what the best ways for heat efficient construction might be. The satellite worked with an incredibly high resolution thermal sensor and was supposed to be the first of eight spacecraft to map the heat efficiency of the planet. It's not the end of the line for this interesting and important mission, thankfully, as there are already plans to relaunch a backup satellite to replace this one in 2025. We only hope that the engineers can work out what went wrong with this particular model's camera, so it doesn't happen on any of the future iterations. And just quickly for this week, NASA has announced that the James Webb Space Telescope will investigate four galaxies chosen for their brightness, the fact they're all forming a huge amount of stars, and their ability to be magnified for us through the process of gravitational lensing. Gravitational lensing is when gravity warps the light of distant stars and galaxies, so they are able to be seen from greater distances. Instances where this happens form incredible opportunities for us to take a peek at super distant parts of our universe that we wouldn't usually be able to, and indeed by extension super old parts of our universe that we also wouldn't usually be able to, and in greater detail. Hubble has taken a look at these galaxies before, but we're all very excited to see just what images the JWST can send us with its top of the range infrared images that will no doubt give us a completely new look at these fascinating parts of our universe. Also in the recent news, a paper has been published demonstrating that dolphins use low electric fields in order to orient themselves. A study in 2022 already found that dolphins are able to detect weak electric fields in water. They have a line of sensitive pores known as vibrissal crypts along their snout. These pores are rich in nerve endings, making them extremely sensitive. To test just how sensitive these pores are, researchers conducted some experiments on two captive dolphins. These two dolphins, called Dolly and Donna, were trained to rest their snouts against a metal bar with electrodes in the water. The dolphins were then provided with a randomly generated stimulus, which induced either an electrical stimulus or nothing at all. The experiment showed that the dolphins could sense electric fields as weak as 2.4 and 5.5 microvolts per centimeter. Whilst this is not as sensitive as sharks and rays, the sensitivity is enough for them to detect weak electric fields from the bodies of their prey, thus allowing them to search for fish hidden in sediment. It is also thought that the snouts are sensitive enough to orient themselves in relation to the Earth's magnetic field. And in other dolphin news, a dolphin with a thumb has recently been photographed off the coast of Greece. The defect is in both the left and right flippers, and it's thought to be due to the expression of some rare and irregular genes due to inbreeding. Luckily, this beautiful dolphin is thriving and is able to keep up and play just fine with its dolphin friends and family. Some prehistoric cetacean news now, as first up in the paleontology news for this week is a fascinating paper investigating the evolution of the lower jaws of toothed whales. The lower jaws, the mandibles, of toothed whales, technically called odontocetes, are particularly interesting as they are highly specialised and enable high frequency sounds to be transmitted to the inner ear, as part of how these animals echolocate, which you can learn more about in my recent video on every time things evolved echolocation. Anyway, this paper therefore looked at 100 living and extinct whale species, analysing the shapes of their mandibles to see how they are varied over time. They discovered two periods of rapid jaw evolution, one in the very early evolution of whales as they adapted from terrestrial to aquatic life, and then another later one in the mid-Oligocene epoch, 
between 20 to 30 million years ago, when they became specialized for a range of different diets and refined their echolocating abilities. Interestingly, there was not much change in the back part of the mandible, suggesting that the way the whales received sounds has remained fairly consistent since the earliest whales evolved directional underwater hearing, and they found that the diet, feeding method, dentition type, and echolocation were all strong drivers of mandible shape. So it seems that the refinement of echolocation plus specialized diets have significantly extended the disparity of mandible shapes in toothed whales. So it's a really interesting look at how we can track evolutionary events over time by documenting how certain bones change shape. Up next, there's been an amazing new study investigating how interbreeding with Neanderthals and Denisovans has affected the genomes of modern Eurasian people with respect to their circadian rhythm, discovering that breeding with other hominins helped make Europeans into morning people. The paper explains that when the ancestors of modern Eurasians migrated out of Africa around 70,000 years ago, they encountered the Neanderthal and Denisovan people who had been living in these regions for hundreds of thousands of years longer. And so when interbreeding between the different species occurred, certain exchanged genes that helped the ancestors of modern Eurasians adapt to higher latitude regions would have been kept from Neanderthals and Denisovans. One of the differences between Africa, where the Eurasian ancestors had come from, and Europe, is much more variable daylight times in Europe. This study has therefore looked at genetic differences in circadian clocks between modern humans and Neanderthals, finding various circadian genes in modern Europeans that seem to have come from introgression events, that is, interbreeding, with Neanderthals. The variants inherited from Neanderthals were found to consistently shorten the period of the circadian clock and therefore increase morningness, meaning it increases the propensity to wake up early. Such an alteration to the circadian biology of European populations likely helped them adapt to more drastically changing seasonal light patterns compared to lower latitudes. And so such a beneficial change to the circadian clock gained from interbreeding with Neanderthals has been preserved in the genome of modern Europeans. So you can thank the Neanderthals for making me wake up early every Wednesday and getting seven days of science to you each week. Also in this week's paleontology news is the very exciting discovery of a new absolutely giant titanosaur from Argentina that may be a new contender for the title of the biggest dinosaur that ever lived. It was discovered in rocks of the Huincul Formation, which dates to the late Cretaceous and is the same formation in which another contender for the largest dinosaur was also found, Argentinosaurus. This new species has been given the name Bustingori Titan Shiva, named for Manuel Bustingori who owned the land on which the fossils were found and helped with the fieldwork, and for Shiva, the supreme deity of Shaivism who destroys and transforms the universe, which, they explain, alludes to the faunal turnover of dinosaurs and other animals that occurred at the Cenomanian Turonian boundary in the middle of the Cretaceous period. Bustingori Titan is known from four different specimens representing at least four individuals in the quarry where they were discovered, and altogether a decent amount of the skeleton is known from these fossils. Several vertebrae, much of the limbs, parts of the hips and pectoral girdle, and even a lower jaw and fragmentary teeth have been recovered. Using the limb measurements to calculate an estimated body mass for this dinosaur, the same method as has been used for other giant sauropods, the authors have come up with a mass of 67.3 metric tons, with an error range of about 17 tons. This is an absolute giant then, putting it within the ranges of body mass estimates for other contenders for largest dinosaur. For example, Dreadnoughtus, named in 2014, has been put at 59.3 metric tons, while Patago Titan, named 2017, is estimated at around 69 tons. So Bustingori Titan is definitely up there, and given the ranges in possible masses for all these giant dinosaurs, there's a good chance that Bustingori Titan could turn out to be the biggest that ever lived. The relationship of this new dinosaur to other sauropods is also another very interesting part of the discovery, as it's been found to be a kind of titanosaur known as a saltosauroid, being the sister taxon to the family Saltosauridae. This is fascinating, as the other absolute largest dinosaurs, such as Argentinosaurus and Patico Titan, belong to a different titanosaur lineage, Lonchosauria, confirming the hypothesis that truly gigantic sizes independently evolved in several titanosaur groups. So an absolutely incredible new contender for the largest dinosaur, and a fascinating paper describing it. And finally for the news this week, we have the report of the first documentation of a megalodon tooth 
found in situ at the bottom of the Pacific Ocean. This short communication reports how a megalodon tooth was filmed by a remotely operated vehicle at a depth of 3,090 meters in the central Pacific Ocean, and it was partially embedded in marine sediments and was then collected by the ROV. Megalodon teeth are usually collected at sites that are easily accessible from land, and so this report highlights the fact that there are also fossils in very inaccessible places, showing how advanced deep diving technologies can be used to discover such fossils. It's a very cool brief documentation, and no, it's not evidence for the survival of Megalodon, as the tooth is very obviously very old. Nice try though. Well, that's it for the news this week. I really hope you enjoyed watching and learning about what's happened in these last seven days of science, and I'll see you on Sunday.